I was in my final university exams at the end of my occupational therapy degree. We had to show a video of a treatment session that we had done to our examiners and then explain like how we were using different treatment protocols and what our goals were and that kind of thing and the theory behind what we were doing. So I had been working in the school and I'd done what I thought was like a super fun session with this little boy. There had been shaving cream, swings, a ball pit. It had been really, really fun. And as the exam finished, one of my examiners said to me, so can you pinpoint where the child entered into play in your session? And I was like, what? <laughs> like I, there was shaving cream and there was a ball pit. <laughs> like, isn't that play? The whole time was play. So they were like, okay, okay, let's rewatch some of the session. So, I mean, of course it was like super awkward to sit there in front of like these really, uh, experienced professionals and have to like watch my session again and by the way if you ever film yourself while working with children make sure that whatever you're wearing it's like tucked in so that your shirt can't ride up as you are like walking forward on a bolster or whatever but anyway so we watch through the session and I, there's this like moment in the session this small moment where you see that the child entered into play. He wasn't any more really concerned that I was there or what the next instruction was. He wasn't like waiting on me to give him commands. He was on a bolster and he'd kind of really forgotten what was going on. And he'd, we'd been doing something like related to bunnies or something. And he had become the bunny and he was playing as he, he was like eating his carrots as he was walking forward. And of course, as like a student, not an experienced clinician, I had like stopped that in the focus of let's meet the goals. Let's move forward so that we're strengthening more. Let's do it like this. Today, we are going to be talking about three dials that we can kind of activate as parents, clinicians, or educators that are working working with young children and how we can use these to really unlock the power of play and play for learning. But before we dive into that, I wanted to tell you about a really exciting event that is happening in the coming weeks. The Toddler Play Conference is back for the fourth time around. We are bringing together fresh new faces for 25 new talks all about learning through play in these foundational years. From therapists diving into core strength and what that means to amazing workshops and play ideas that you can start implementing in your clinic or in your school or in your home immediately, you can come and join us for the free version of the conference or you can upgrade and buy it as a course with lectures from 25 experts with bonuses like a private podcast feed, as well as a certificate for learning and so much more. I would love to see you there. Hit the link below and come and join us. In my work as an occupational therapist, as well as the last three years of running the Toddler Play Conference and, you know, having interviewed over 200 experts in the early childhood development and education niche and serving uh, over 20,000 families, clinicians and teachers through the conference, I have kind of taken in that we understand play in a, a way that's kind of like a pendulum that swings. On the one hand of this pendulum, we have the concept of free play, which, you know, if you're like most families, you've probably embraced this in some sense. Maybe you've signed up for the thousand hours outside challenge or you've bought the Grimm's rainbow. Then on the other side of that pendulum, we have directed learning in a more traditional or even dry sense. You know, when you think of like children lined up in desks and a teacher standing in the front educating or directing them on some kind of concept. And I see that often when we talk about play, we kind of are swinging to which is right. Uh, these two concepts, instead of seeing them in a, a new, more unified way, while most people may have a clear idea of the difference between these two, you know, this free play and this like really adult directed learning, when it comes down into practice, we're not really seeing that the free play is where the pendulum is always staying, right? We know that American children currently have on average four to seven minutes of outdoor unstructured time per day, which is really drastically below what we would actually recommend. So while we might embrace these concepts of free play, doesn't necessarily always get actually taken off the idea bench and put into practice. I believe that as people working with children as well as being parents, we are in a perfect position to change this. We have a deep understanding of the interconnectedness of learning and play. We know that while play is often confused as like that excitement of receiving a toy, 
you know, I talk about how that like this is kind of different from real play because it's like the same feeling of buying new gym clothes as opposed to actually going to the gym. We know that play isn't just that excitement of receiving something new. We also know that when children are playing, it's both the means and the end. We know that through play, through that means, they are building really interconnected neural pathways in their brain. They are building up all of that developmental scaffolding. It is the means for that, but it's also an end because we know that when children learn how to play, they essentially learn how to learn and that is a skill that is a goal within itself for our children in their life. A few years ago, the Lego Foundation released a white paper on kind of a review of evidence around learning through play and what it really means. And in this, they kind of looked at playful learning from literature as an umbrella term. And underneath that umbrella, we have on one side, child-led play. We then have directed play, which is child-led, but adult scaffolded. And then we have games that have more like a a strict rule structure. And then on the final side, we have this uh, directed learning or instruction, which again is part of life. It's not a bad thing to have direct instruction. But when we look at playful learning and the power of it, we know that it can't just be direct instruction. It should be a balance between these things. Now, while we often are like easy to run to child-led play, I see that this guided play, the area where we are activating those tools that we have of scaffolding, of understanding age-appropriate development, and really putting that in place into the environment, into the way that we respond to children, into the interactions that we provide for children, that's where the, the the juice really is. And I think for this generation specifically, that's where we're kind of falling short. So today I want to share with you three kind of dials that we can play with as parents, therapists, or professionals working with children that we can play with to really unlock the power of play, to really infuse play into our children's lives and into their learning as well. I do want to just add a little caveat here that there are specific therapeutic protocols or educational protocols that we follow that are based only on either directed learning or only on child-led learning. This is not necessarily the the three dials that we're talking about today. We're kind of aiming more towards the the guided learning. While child-led is amazing, I do think that we have a place and we have a huge potential for supporting our children when we activate our own skills as the adults in terms of building that scaffolding. So the first dial that we can play with is making sure that there is playtime, whether it is recess time that is more open or if it is like stations where children in the morning come in and they can move between different stations, whether it's in a Montessori shelf, we want to make sure that there is time that children like that little boy in my exam, that they're allowed to take whatever we've provided and then start actually adding their own story into that, that we are giving them the space and the time to be able to take those things, take their play and their learning a step further and truly engage around it. So our first dial is the time aspect. It's easy to think that we provide this, but when we look back at our schedule, look at your schedule and say, is there time here where the plan can change where I've provided maybe letters and matching cards, but the the child can turn those letters into food if they want to. Is there time that they are actually able to start engaging in that play? So the goal of that time would be not necessarily that at the end of it, our child has learned X, Y, Z, but the goal is that they've been engaged for 15, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, that they've been engaged in play. We know how powerful this is for building up their attention and concentration. And again, all of that developmental scaffolding. The second one might be a little bit controversial. In working within the play sphere, I get an email, uh, if not weekly, monthly, that says, but don't children just play naturally? Like, is play really something that we have to teach children? I think we have to come to terms with the fact that our generation is really different. I am from South Africa. My early experiences working as a therapist were working in really, really rural conditions. I mean, there's not built houses, right? And in those conditions, what I saw was children engaging in really meaningful play, whether it was taking an old milk carton or rocks or sticks or old tires, they found ways to be engaging in play in really meaningful ways, in socially social play. Uh, They made play out of what they had. When we look at this generation of children, we can't ignore, and it's, I think, dangerous to keep pretending to ignore, that 
we have a huge pull from screens, from screens, from overscheduling. If we look back at like this example of these children in a really rural context in Africa to compared to, I'll say for my own children, uh, their, their structure of their day or the time that they feel like this is my designated playtime and I can actually engage is really, really different. What that means is that it's not always a very natural thing that children are engaging in skills that they need to develop in order to be able to engage in play. So I want to share an example of what this actually looks like, because when we say teach play skills, it can feel a little bit confusing and Sometimes the boundaries of where the child leads and where the adult leads and steps back is a little bit unclear. So I worked in a preschool uh, a couple of years back. And what we noticed is that our children would go out into their recess time and they would all just like find some kind of a corner. We had a great outdoor area. They would find some kind of a corner and just plop themselves down. Now, this was a special education preschool, so it does like makes sense that sometimes we need to be providing a little bit of extra scaffolding in order for some of the play to take place. But to be honest, I see the same kind of interaction and the same kind of apprehension in terms of play happening a lot when we have children over to play, when we go to the park, when we're in outdoor environments, um, that the sometimes we see like that the play is too hyped up um, and the children just don't have enough experience to bring that play down to like a, a functional and meaningful level. Um, and on the other hand, we see like just a, a sense of no ownership within play. So when we teach some specific play skills, we actually give our children the tools to then be able to play in more meaningful ways. So in the preschool that I worked in, I was part of a very, very skilled multidisciplinary team um, that was working with these kids. And we had a lot of like back and forth on how how do we support our children in that free time and actually make it free time um, without needing to sit on top of them and direct them constantly through that time. So what we came up with was an idea to have a kind of rotation of a small amount of time that we would do together as a group that would then lead our children into being able to use the different equipment in the, the outdoor area and then also like kind of ignite uh, a, a motivation towards playing. So what we did, for example, on one of the days of the week, we would take balls and play uh, kind of a, a track or a, um, obstacle course with a ball on the slide. So kids would pick up one of the balls, climb up the slide, slide down and throw it down. So they were learning that we were there to help them support them if they didn't know how to climb up the equipment, but then also that they could use the ball and interlock the play in that way. We had a day where we would hide things in the sandbox and then they would have to pull them out. And what we saw is that this was really effective in kind of uh, putting that initiation into our children, but also then teaching them the ways that they could play with this equipment. So children that we had seen really not engaging with anything for the first two months that they were in this preschool, we saw them really come alive in terms of what they were asking for, uh, what they were heading towards, and the way that they were playing with the different things that were available within the outdoor area. So I think maybe in a previous generation, we could presume that children are learning ball skills at home, that if we present a ball, they know how to play with it, uh, that they have ideas, you know, they have like that menu in their head of we could throw it we could kick it we could throw it into something we could hide it like they have that menu of ways that we can play with something but in the actual practical day-to-day -day of this lifestyle that is very busy I don't know that that is necessarily true I think that sometimes whether it be you know demonstrating for children how they can play with the sandbox or a ball or a bicycle or a skipping rope, I, I do think that we can really support our children when we give them some kind of clues and teach them some basic ways to play with the different equipment and things that we have available. So the third dial is about physical spaces. Having a place that says this is for you and there are things that you can do here is so important for children. Having things that are accessible, but also that spark some kind of 
of curiosity. I was just laughing yesterday because I have um, in our playroom a jar with a set of tongs and some toys at the bottom. And this is the toy that whenever friends come over, this is like the first thing that they go to because it kind of sparks their curiosity in some way. And it is out, it is available for our children. So they go to that and they start engaging with it. When we set up our physical space in a way that invites children into play, it's just making sure that the play will actually happen, right? It's not something that we're putting barriers and walls in the way of saying you have to request, find, and seek out uh, these kind of things in order to be able to play. So the physical environment is huge in terms of providing that scaffolding for guided play as well as free play. And in the Toddler Play Conference, my talk is actually all about this, about how we can take inspiration from the idea of Montessori shelves and use this in our homes, in our clinics, in our education centers, uh, and even as home programs. So I would love for you to come and join us at the conference. You'll be able to hear my talk as well as the other 24 talks from experts in the field of early childhood education and development and I can't wait to see you there. Come and hit the link down below and join us for the conference. It's happening on the 20th of March and it is going to be so much fun. I'll see you there.